This is Brother Rashid with another Omega Ministry live stream broadcast. Be doing Bible study tonight. Glad to have you on. Sorry, I'm a little tardy, but I'm going to get set up here and we will get into the message for this evening. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us tonight. All right, looks like we're streaming live. So again, apologize for the tardiness. We'll get into these announcements. Want to definitely keep in the the pattern of the announcements for the ministry. The first announcement tonight is the prayer line following immediately after the Bible study. That number is 805-399-1000. Three nine nine one thousand, <clears throat> and the access code is four zero nine three six seven. Four zero nine three six seven. It'll prompt you to punch in an access code once you dial that number, and that access code again is four zero nine three six seven. Call into the prayer line. Prayer is our lifeline. Our second announcement tonight is. For the Army of God conference coming up May 22nd through the 25th, 2015 in Atlanta, Georgia at the Renaissance Hotel. The Army of God conference registration is open. Registration is available. All the information can be found on the Omega Ministries website at www.omegaministry.org. You'll see that banner as soon as you go to the website. That'll give you all the information needed for the conference. It'll be a great time of preparation and fellowship with the brethren. Please be sure to visit the website and come and see the, the body of Christ gathered together on one accord in Atlanta, Georgia. Looking forward to that in May. So check that out on the website, omegaministry.org. Our third announcement tonight is support Dunamis Tabernacle. Dunamis Tabernacle is an effort from the ministry to raise up a location where the body of Christ can be equipped and trained to do the work of the ministry. We live in a day and age where you have to be prepared to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God is has gone forward for this year and that word is preparation it's time to prepare and this dunamis tabernacle location is designed for just that preparation for the end time army as well as a place of refreshing where you can come and worship the lord jesus christ and have some rest from the warfare so support the efforts from omega ministry to raise up dunamis tabernacle there's a full-blown video on YouTube. If you just type in youtube.com, look up Dunamis Tabernacle uh, dash Omega Ministries, and you should be able to find a video that gives the outline for what this location is all about. It's not the same thing. So check it out so you can see for yourself. Dunamis Tabernacle, support it. Go to the website and support it. Support it. Thank you for those that have been faithfully supporting the ministry. <clears throat> God will bless you for your support. In the last announcement, keeping in the pattern with the books that are being recommended for you to read, we've been recommending for the past couple of months now, War on the Saints, Jesse Penn Lewis. Jesse Penn Lewis is the author. I actually have the book. I hadn't started reading it yet, but That'll be my next book that I'm reading. The book that I've been reading that I'll suggest is a book by Derek Prince entitled, let me pull this up here, Rules of Engagement, Pre Preparing Your Role for a Spiritual Battle, Rules of Engagement. That's what, the, that's what the cover looks like there. Has a breastplate 
preparing, which is what I just shared not too long ago. This is a really good book. If you've ever heard Derek Prince teach or read any of his books, it's very easy to follow if you have a heart and mind to understand. Preparing for your role in the spiritual battle. It's real. Rules of engagement, war on the saints. These are all warfare manuals to keep the body of Christ moving forward. I have another book here. Another book here that I want to recommend to you. Uh, I don't know where I put it. But that book is Leadership is Male by David, by David Pawson. Leadership is Male is another book that we are recommending to the, to the saints to read. It's very important to have a good habit of reading. I always think about the saying and meditate on this often. What you do daily determines what you become permanently. What you do daily determines what you become permanently. So if you make a habit and a pattern of feeding on books that edify your spirit and build you up and draw you closer into your relationship with Christ, along with your study of the Bible, you'll do well. So we got War on the Saints with Jesse Penn Lewis. We have Leadership is Male with David Pawson. And we have the book that I'm recommending, which is <clears throat> Preparing for Battle, Rules of Engagement by Derek Prince. Rules of Engagement. All of these books can be found on Amazon for the most part. You can also go to uh, davidpawson.org to order any of his books, as well as Derek Prince has a website out there where you can purchase his material as well. So get, get you a book, you know, just once uh, make a goal of, you know, reading a book per three months. So I should be finished with this book in the next month or so. And then I'll shift over to probably Leadership is Mail. And that may take me two weeks to a month to read. And then you just methodically do that throughout the month along with your Bible study. So just to recap on the announcements. Prayer line following immediately after the message tonight. Please call in, join in the, in the prayer efforts of the saints. The Bible says that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Don't lose your fight in prayer. We need people praying and interceding, especially in this day and age. Dunamis Tabernacle support it. The Army of God Conference register for it if you plan on coming out. You can always go to the Facebook page. There's an event page on Facebook where you can simply put that you're going even if you're not able to pay right away, which is perfectly fine. And get you one of these books, if not all of them, to keep your spirit man fed and built up in the Lord. That's our announcements for this evening. And we will pray and get into the word of God for tonight. Hallelujah. Father God in heaven. We come before you, Lord, seeking to hear your voice, God. We need to hear your voice, Father. In a dry and thirsty land, God, in a land that's barren, we need to hear the voice that comes from heaven. We need to be refreshed, Father God. So we come with an open mind, a ready heart to receive tonight, Lord. And we sit at your feet. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, you speak through these lips of clay, Father. And that you open the eyes of our understanding, Lord, that we may know you. That we may know you in the power of your resurrection. We want to see the life of Christ manifested in our mortal bodies, Lord. So teach us your ways, O God. Teach us to do your will. Teach our hands to war and our fingers to fight. And root and ground the word of God in us tonight, Father God, as we yield to you. And we just commit this time to you, Father God. Bless our minds to understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. All right, fill in the blank. God is. God is. God is love. God is truth. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is holy. God is just. All of these are characteristics and attributes of the Almighty God. When you think about these attributes and traits of God, it tells you 
a little bit about who he is. God is all knowing. God is pure. God is perfect. And tonight we'll take one of those traits, one of those attributes and seek to gain a deeper knowledge and a greater understanding of this awesome God that we serve. We know that knowing God is the, the, the endeavor of every Christian to know God. What's, what's greater than that? Have you found anything more important than knowing God? To know him, Paul said in Philippians 3. To relate to him, to be intimate with him is what it's all about. So the trait that we'll be examining tonight is God is righteous. God is righteous. <clears throat> and the goal is to develop a deeper a deeper roots, deeper roots in the word of God about just who this God we serve truly is. Who is he really? And we see the problem with today's world, with what's going on around us as it relates to God being righteous is that the world is trying with everything in them to get rid of moral absolutes. The world is trying everything to get rid of moral absolutes. We live in a culture where the goal is to be tolerant of all people groups and to be politically correct. You take that and you face it with God being righteous and you have a clash. There's a dilemma there. And the solution to that dilemma is found in the word of God. It's found in the word of God. And tonight, the whole objective of this message will be is that your faith, your faith is placed in facts. See, if your faith is in fantasy, if it's in any other thing other than facts that can be proven, that can be traced, then your faith will be shaky your faith won't have the stand that's necessary with what's coming ahead of us your faith has to be in facts that can't be changed so tonight we'll examine this as it relates to god's righteousness god is righteous and let me define that before we get into the scriptures the word righteous means morally right or justifiable Anytime you see righteous, you, you usually see the word justice right behind it. Like a hand in, it's a hand in glove. Righteousness and justice are usually right along the side of each other. The synonyms actually help us to, to understand this a little bit better. The synonyms are blameless, guiltless, holy, innocent, just, or sinless. Blameless, guiltless, holy, innocent, just, and sinless. You think about those words and that, that reminds you of, of somebody. And the name that comes to mind is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sinless. Jesus Christ was blameless. He was guiltless and he was holy. So we see this here. God is righteous. And this word righteous is riddled throughout the whole old and new testament when you do a word study on this particular word you see this word i mean filled throughout the old and new testament and tonight we're going to be uncovering the fact that god is righteous in the midst of culture changing and conforming into who knows what god remains righteous we'll jump it off in psalm 97 turn with me to psalm 97 <clears throat> Psalm 97 and I'll read one verse here I'll read two verses verses 1 and 2 the Lord reigns let the earth rejoice let the multitude of isles be glad clouds and darkness surround him righteousness and justice 
are the foundation of his throne. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fact number one. Fact number one. God's kingdom is founded upon righteousness. The first fact that we'll discuss in this message is the fact that God's kingdom is founded upon righteousness. When you think about the founder or something being founded, you take a, a person who, who finds an organization, the CEO and founder. I can assure you that when you talk to that person, if you have any questions about that organization, how it started, why it started, what was the vision, the mission, the very beginnings of that organization or that company, when you talk to that founder, you can pretty much get just about any question answered from that particular person. Why? Because they were there when it started. They were there at the beginning. God's kingdom is founded upon righteousness. The foundation of anything is the most important thing. The foundation of anything is the most important thing. The foundation of a family is, in the natural, the fathers. Why is that true? Because the father is where you see the lineage of that family continue. You see a young woman given in marriage. She then takes on the last name of that person that she marries, and the name of the family, the lineage of the family is continued because of the father, that's the foundation of that family. Now that's in the natural. In the spiritual, the foundation of the family is God Almighty. The Bible is clear. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of the woman. And the children are in subjection. Man, woman, children. A threefold cord is not easily broken. So you see, the foundation has to be set in order in order for it to be right. The foundation for a marriage, a husband and a wife, is usually, in most cases, this is, this is a healthy foundation for most marriages. You know what it is? Friendship. Friendship. The reason why it's friendship is because when, you know, when everything goes wrong, when the, the bills are, are uh, behind and when things get troublesome, what will keep that, that relationship intact is the fact that that husband and wife are friends. You know your friends, the people you laugh with, you call up, you joke with. When, you're, when your spouse is your friend, you have a strong foundation in your marriage. And we see this attack on marriage. We see this affrontery on marriage. There's a, there's a show right now called um, <clears throat> uh, Marriage at First Sight where these experts basically talk to one person. They'll, they'll talk to the man and find out what he wants in a woman, what he likes. They'll talk to the, the woman, find out what she wants, what she likes. And without these two people even meeting together, they will basically set up and schedule a wedding where they actually get married at first sight. Literally, when they first meet is at the wedding. That's absolutely crazy. You're basically making divorce an option. Divorce should never even be an option when you get married. Why? Because when you get married... You make a vow to that person, till death do us apart. Death is supposed to be the splitter of that marriage. Now, does it work like that for everybody? No, of course not. We know a lot of people have gotten divorced and remarried. Yeah, that's, that's a whole nother conversation that I won't get into. But the point is, when you, when you take something like marriage and you attempt to make it an, an experiment, what you lose is the foundation for what will make it healthy, what will make it legitimate. So talking about a foundation, a foundation is everything. The foundation of any business is money. You can't run a business without money. 
So you need a strong accountant, you need a strong CPA to have a strong business, a strong foundation in business. God's kingdom is founded upon righteousness. And I said earlier, righteousness and justice go hand in hand. Wherever you see righteousness, you'll see justice. Have you ever <clears throat> have you ever been to court? Have you ever gotten a ticket and had to go to court? Now you're entering into an environment of righteousness and justice. You have a judge. That judge stands as a person to decide whether or not what your, what your case should be. You have to enter into a plea which says guilty, not, not guilty, or no contest. You're entering into an environment where righteous must, righteousness must have its place. Justice must be served in order for you to go about your daily life. I was talking to a guy the other day and I asked him what the what was the biggest difference between humans and animals? What was the biggest difference between humans and animals? And he answered and said morality, morality. The difference between a human and an animal is the fact that uh, it's fact that animals they have no sense of government. They have no sense of right and wrong. You go to the safari and a lion gets hungry, he's going he's gonna to go find the nearest thing to, you know, for a snack. He's going to go find the nearest thing to eat for lunch. He has no discretion. He has no, uh, none of the things that we use for decision making. Survival of the fittest. Strongest one wins. Only the strong survive. That's the mentality. Whereas in human life, where there's morality, there's righteousness, you have a judge that can stand between two people and, and listen to a case and say, no, 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 that's not right. That doesn't sound right. You know, shows like Divorce Court. All of those shows are founded upon righteousness and justice. I spend a lot of time in eviction court because I do property management at my, at my job. And it's amazing to watch a, a female judge give the verdict on a case. And I've watched people, I mean, they throw papers and, you know, judge, they have all their excuses for why they didn't pay their rent. And it's amazing to watch this female judge calm the person down and ask them a simple question. And she'll say something like this. I need you to answer this question, yes or no. Did you pay last month's rent? Well, judge, the landlord, they didn't fix nothing. And, you know, they ain't. At... Okay, I, I understand. I'm going to ask you this question again. Did you pay last month's rent? She's trying to get to the righteousness of this case. She's trying to get to serving justice. Now, the landlord didn't get paid. He's still, the person's still in the house. They ain't turned in the key, right? They go to that courtroom, justice is served. This is God's kingdom. This is how it functions. This is what the world, this is what the world hates. It hates the fact that God's kingdom is set up to determine right from wrong, good from evil, Morality from immorality, righteousness from unrighteousness. And this fact has to be embedded deep in our souls, deep in our hearts to know that this is the very beginnings. This is the, the very pillar of God's kingdom is the fact that it's founded on righteousness. If you look at someone uh, building a house, the most important aspect of building that house is laying a proper foundation. Now, if you got some good builders, they can do it in about a week or two. But technically, on paper, if there was an inspector around, it would take about three weeks, 28 days, anywhere between seven and 28 days to lay a proper foundation. Now, that's just a normal three-bedroom, two-bath house, four-bedroom, two-bath house. Imagine if that house was you know, 10 bedrooms, you know, you got mansions that's 10, 15 bedrooms. Let's go even further than that. 
Take a place like the Toyota Center here in Houston. That's where the Rockets play. You know, a place like the Reliance Stadium where the Texans play. And what it takes to get a foundation for that type of building, for that size of building. This is extremely critical. This is a fact, you guys. Psalm 97 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. It's what it's built on. It can't be moved. If the foundation is not right, guess what you got to do? You got to tear down the whole house. You can't, you can't restructure the foundation without tearing the thing that the foundation is built on. If you got a skyscraper and all of a sudden you discover you got some foundation issues, man, you got some serious problems. So that's why it's an ample amount of time spent, spent laying that foundation. All right, that's fact number one. God's kingdom is founded upon righteousness. Fact number two, you and I are living in the last days on planet Earth. You've heard that. If you've listened to this message any length of time, you, you've heard that. You know that. But your faith, your confidence has to be sure as it relates to this truth. We are living in the last days. Turn to Isaiah 26. We are living in the last days on planet Earth. Isaiah 26. <clears throat> and we'll look at verses 7 through 11. The scripture reads, the way of the just is uprightness. O most upright, you weigh the path of the just. Yes, in the way of your judgment, in the way of your judgments. O Lord, we have waited for you. The desire of our soul is for your name and for the remembrance of you. With my soul, I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within you, I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. When the judgments of God are in the earth, the inhabitants, the people that live in the earth, will learn righteousness. So why all the chaos and anarchy today? Why all the calamity on the planet? The judgments of God are being slowly but surely removed from this world. Some years ago, they used to have the Ten Commandments in the court. Not that the Ten Commandments is, you know, the greatest thing on the planet, but it gives people a, a, a consciousness of God when they see it. They remove that prayer out of schools. There's been a deliberate effort to remove the judgments, the visual and deliberate judgments of God in the earth, out of the earth. This is the only way that people learn righteousness. So what do we see? Unrighteousness prevailing. I thought about this and I said, man, I wonder if there's any any uh, correlation, any parallel to cri the crime rate. And I looked this up. Check this out. These are the top 10 states with the, mo with the highest murder rate in 2013. The top 10 states with the highest murder rate in 2013. Now, 32 out of the 50 states have the death penalty. 32 out of, out of 50 have the death penalty. Look at these states that have the highest murder rate. Kansas City, Missouri is number 10. Out of almost 500,000 people, this is one year, 100 people were, were murdered. Now they have the death penalty there. You got Baton Rouge, Louisiana at number 9. Oakland, California. Cincinnati, Ohio. Birmingham, Alabama. Baltimore, Maryland. They actually call Baltimore body more because of all the people that get killed in this city. In Baltimore, the population of people there is 622,000 people. And they had in one year, 233 murders. 233 people murdered out of 622,000 people. St. Louis, Missouri. Newark, New Jersey. Look at the numbers now. We're getting down to number one. We're talking about when the judgments of God are removed and what happens 
to the inhabitants. What happens to people when God's judgments are taken away from people's eyesight and people's hearing? In Newark, New Jersey, 112 people were murdered out of 278,000 people. At number two is New Orleans, Louisiana. And at number one is Detroit, Michigan. Over 300 murders. Over 300 murders. And you know what's really interesting about these 10 states is that the top three, out of the top three states, only two of them have the death penalty. And that's Newark, New, uh, that's only one of them, excuse me, have the death penalty. So Detroit, Michigan, number one, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Newark, New Jersey. New Orleans, Louisiana is the only state out of those three that have the death penalty. Why is that unique? Why is that significant? Because it's something about when a person knows if I kill somebody, my life is going to be taken. See, that's a judgment against me. If I go and kill this person, I pay for their death with my life. That's actually the Old Testament law. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So there are remnants of the righteous governments of God in terms of how the laws used to be that are still in place. That was the that was the way it worked in the Old Testament. You pay for a life with your life. If 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 somebody's bull was lost at your hands, you paid for it. And we see that the only two only one of these states have the death penalty and the murder rates are sky high. In Chicago, man, it's it's off the charts out there with people just being killed and murdered. All this stuff going on where the young boy was shot by the police officer. I mean, it's just the judgments being removed from the earth, trying to redefine marriage. There's a, a recent, uh, recent news clip on the Presbyterian Church, one of the largest denominations, one of the largest Protestant denominations have just approved gay marriage. They've already been working to approve it, but now it's official. The United Methodist Church or the United Church of Christ had already approved it. Now the Presbyterian Church has approved it. And when I read that article, I noticed some interesting words. They talked about redefining, uh, new wording. Now, go back to the point of something being foundational. If you try to alter the foundation, you got to tear the whole thing down. Now you got to rebuild it. See, now it's your responsibility. You can't redefine something that God established. You can't do that. It's not right. It's not righteous. It's not permitted. It's unrighteous. Marriage is not an experiment. Marriage is a God idea. Think about this. Marriage in a natural sense, one man, one woman, joined together in holy matrimony. But guess what? Marriage is not just in a natural sense. If you redefine marriage in the natural, guess what you got to do? You got to redefine it in the spiritual. Because the marriage supper of the Lamb is not going to be redefined. Jesus and his church, that's the real marriage. That's what this is really about. Everything taking place on earth is a reflection of what's happening in the heavenlies. So what I'm saying on this live stream tonight is you are not permitted to redefine marriage. It's God ordained. It's a God idea. It's to re, re to procreate and populate the earth. And you can't do that with two men. Two homosexuals cannot repopulate the earth in a natural organic way and it's not right it will never be right no matter what denomination accepts it no matter who says that it's okay it's not right you can't change the foundation of God it's not possible it won't happen and that needs to be stated clearly that's a fact you can't change it Look at the teen pregnancy stats. In 2013, there were 26.5 births for every 1,000 adolescent females ages 15 through 19 
or 273,000 babies born to females in this age group. Now, now let's think about this. Over 250,000 babies born to babies. 15 through 19, you're still a child. The brain is still developing until the age 24. And you already are in a position to have another child. Listen to this. Nearly, nine, nearly 89% of these births occur outside of marriage. That's staggering. 89, almost 90% of these births, over 250,000 babies, are born out of a committed, God-ordained relationship. I speak with young people all the time. I work with young people. And what you get from these young girls is a lack of commitment from a guy. He, he doesn't want to commit. And I can attest to this. When I was in the world, you know, in what I call my BC days, before Christ. That's what I say, before Christ. In my BC days, because of the lack of righteousness, the lack of commitment and integrity in my own heart, I couldn't commit to a woman. So this is what you see. You see a, a, a society and a culture that lacks righteousness. They're unrighteous. The judgments of God have been removed. And this is the only way that people learn righteousness. That's how they learn it. These statistics are amazing. This show, Marriage at First Sight. I mean, whose idea was this? Where, did this, where is this stuff coming from? What? What concept of marriage do y'all have? It has absolutely nothing to do with what God has put in his word. Our faith has to be in facts. If our faith is not in facts, then we have no stand. You can't stand. But I can stand on this word of God and say that homosexual marriage is absolutely wrong. It's wrong. Two women being married, absolutely wrong. Because God defines what it is. That's critical. That's critical. Fact number three. God's word is not a boomerang. God's word is not a boomerang. Turn to Isaiah 45. We already in Isaiah. Flip over a few chapters. Isaiah 45. God is righteous. <clears throat> Isaiah 45 verse 23 the scripture reads I have sworn by myself let me go up let me read starting at verse 21 Isaiah 45 21 it says tell and bring forth your case yes let them take counsel together who has declared this from ancient time who has told it from that time have I have not I the Lord and there is no other God beside me, a just God and a savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and it shall not return. When the word of God is preached, when the word of God is spoken, it shall not return to him. It's not going to circle back and come back to the Lord. When the word goes out, it stands in front of a person's face like concrete. It stands there. That's why the preaching of the gospel, the Bible says that God saves those that believe through the foolishness of preaching. Why would God choose preaching? It, it's the power of words, the power of the spoken word. The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. When that word comes out of your mouth, if spoken under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, will always be in that person's remembrance. When you preach the gospel and a person has heard the truth, that word will never return to the person that spoke it. So what does that mean to you and me? Preach the gospel. Be instant in season and out of season. Tell people the truth. You don't preach soliciting a response from people. You preach out of obedience to the word of God. God is seeking people 
who have been properly trained under the right ministries, under the right teaching, under the right doctrine, to be voices. God, God needs a mouthpiece. He needs a mouth that will speak for him. I believe Burt Clendenin said that often. It's not me talking about God. I'm not talking about God. I am speaking for him. I am an ambassador for Christ representing him. I represent God. And when you represent God, you must be willing to take the consequences for standing for righteousness. There's, there's ramifications and, and penalties for everything that we do, good or bad. And we must be totally convinced in our own mind. You must be so convicted about the truth that you believe. That you can't be moved. This is factual. I don't care who I'm talking to. I'm not partial to this. This is a fact, man. My faith are in facts. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. And Jesus rose again. You can put some weight down on that. That's a historical event. It happened in real life. The uh, Noah's flood happened in real life. See, the devil is fighting our faith. He's, he's coming against your confidence in the word of God. That's what he's warring against. He's not really that concerned about you. He doesn't want you to have confidence in the truth of God's word because he knows it doesn't change. He knows that the word of God will not pass away. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but this word, will never pass away it's eternal and he knows that if you get a, a study life he knows that if you get confidence which is faith that's what faith is faith is confidence confidence that what god said in this word is absolutely true i don't budge i'm not wavering on it i'm absolutely sure about what i believe that's what the devil is fighting that's what he hates he hates people that are assured of what's true Jesus said it often, verily, verily, I say unto you, truly, truly, meaning this is absolute, buddy. Everything I said has been true, but I'm about to place some emphasis on this right here. You must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. Don't even waste your time, Nicodemus. Don't waste your time, man. You must be born of water and spirit to even see what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about tonight, faith and facts. These things are factual. When, when the word of God goes out, all the messages that have been preached from this ministry, all the messages of truth that have been preached from other ministries. I mean, this is not a new thing. This has been going on for years, all the word. You know how many people have heard it? That it's going to be called back to their remembrance. You heard the truth. You knew the truth, but you didn't yield to it. Most people run game. I'm learning this a lot, man. People run game. People are con artists. They know what to say, when to say it, how to say it, how much to say it to get what they want. You ever had somebody call you when they lose their job and when they're going through and, brother, pray for me. I need your help. And See, now they I have a need at this point. Jesus knew that when he dealt with people. When he fed the five, when he fed the people, the five, the the uh, five fish and the two loaves, the two loaves and the five fish and two loaves. <laughs> when Jesus fed them, he says, he says, you know what y'all's problem is? Y'all are not following me and seeking me because of the miracle that I did. It was a miracle, and what he did. He says, y'all are following me because you got full. He says, labor not for the food that perishes but labor for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man have give, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Man, don't follow me because of the natural, the natural blessing that you can get. Follow me for the eternal value that I put upon your life. And man, when they got into that conversation, they were about ready to kill Jesus because he confronted them and basically told them, hey, look, y'all are carnal and you're under the inspiration of your father who is, who is the devil. That's your problem. So we see in this word right here, Isaiah 45, 23, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. You see that word there? It's there. And shall not return 
that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. He shall say, Surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come, and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. God is righteous. His righteousness stands forever. God is, is unchangeable. He's unchangeable. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New. People have this thing where, you know, God was such and such, or he was like this in the Old Testament, and he's not the same in the New Testament. That's not true. The differences between the Old and the New Testament is something called covenants. Uh, uh, another way to think about it, it's not the greatest way to explain it, but it's a, uh, a contract or an agreement. The old contract, the old covenant, the Old Testament was the old agreement or contract between God and man, which was the law of Moses. But the Bible says when Jesus came, there was a new covenant, a new and living way that brought grace and truth. Same God, just a new covenant. So God hasn't changed. His righteousness is the foundation of his throne. Look at Romans chapter one. Turn with me to Romans chapter one. <clears throat> Romans chapter one, verse 18 It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Now, mark that, underline that, highlight that. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. They're not almost seen. They're not vague. They're clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Why? What, what, what purpose does that have? So that they are without excuse. On the day of judgment, when people have to stand in God's court and give an account for what they did with this life that they live, they will be without excuse. That's what the Bible says. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And then you go down and you read how God gives them up to uncleanness. God gives them up to vile passions and he gives them over to a debased mind. Reprobation, the road to reprobation is found right here in Romans chapter one. The Bible says they didn't want to retain God. They didn't want to keep God in their thinking. Which is why they remove, they're, they're removing any trace of God. You know, they, I read an article about I believe it was the 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 Navy, the branch of the military, the Navy, and they were trying to ban the soldiers from saying, uh, uh, "Have a blessed day." Just the word "blessed," they don't even want. They don't want any trace of God in their thinking. Anything that sounds like it might have came from God, we want to get rid of it. You and I are living in the last days. These are the last days on planet Earth. The murder rate is gone, is, is, is shooting through the sky. The pregnancy rate, the marriage is being defiled. I mean, everything that had some type of morality, some type of dignity is being defiled. The righteousness of man <clears throat> is going away. That's what we see here in Romans chapter 1. We see a downgrading of mankind. Taking steps down. This is where we see homosexuality being exposed. Even women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. 
Verse 27, likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful. Now, either it's shameful or it's not. And what I'm saying is I stand on the side of God. I stand on the fact that the word of God is true. I stand on the fact that God is true and let every man be a liar. Receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. This is real. Look at verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness. That's what this is about. It's the war of the righteous and the unrighteous. Don't kid yourself by thinking that the Presbyterian church has anything to do with the true church of Jesus Christ. The true bride of Christ would never sign off on something that the word of God does not represent. It won't happen. The true bride. When you study the Bible, you see that there are two brides, or two churches rather. There's the harlot church. That word harlot is synonymous with prostitute, unfaithful. And then there is the true bride, the chaste virgin of the Lord that's preparing herself for his return. Which church are, do you belong to? Which church are you in? If you're in the harlot church, the Bible says, come out from amongst them and separate yourselves. Separate yourself from the unclean and God will receive you to himself. God will receive you, man. That's that's amazing that we can come out of a dirty, filthy, decadent life and God will take us in. That's the grace of God right there. That's the grace of God. Fact number four. God's righteousness is consistent. One of the things I love about God is that he is consistent. He doesn't change. He's constant. You can count on him. When you know him and when you have come to understand what he says about himself in the word, you can count on it. You can count on it. We see God's righteousness being consistent in Genesis 3. I won't read. I won't turn there, but. God told Adam, he said, this is what's going to happen. If you do this, I'm going to do this. And what did he do? He drove them out the garden when they sinned. This is where the, the, the righteousness of man was lost in the garden, the fall of man. When Adam sinned, him and his wife sinned in the garden. That righteousness that they had, that purity that, that blamelessness that they had was lost. God was consistent. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. If you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. Now think about it. Pastor Price preached a message, uh, I believe it was last week, called What is Love? And some would probably ask themselves the question, why couldn't God give them another chance? Why couldn't he? And you go, down, you go through your mind in these questions. Why couldn't God just forgive them or whatever the case may have been? God is righteous, and he does exactly what he said he's, said he's going to do. Is he gracious? Absolutely. He's full of love, full of mercy. God pours out mercy. And we see, <clears throat> we see that through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The mercy and the, the, the graciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is what we see through the gospel. We see that in Noah's flood. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, and you don't have to turn there. You can make a note of it. It says in Genesis chapter 6 that the thought, every thought and inclination of man was continually evil, consistently evil. Now imagine that. Say, for instance, you live in a neighborhood and everybody in the neighborhood has become evil. Not even you would want to live there. And God found one man that was what? What was he? What did the Bible say he was? Noah was a just man. He was a righteous man. And through Noah, God was able to preserve the human race by washing all those evil people out in the flood and repopulating the earth. What's my point? When God says he's going to do something, you can count on it. If he says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, you need to get out, take your family and go. It's an absolute. 
It's, it's, it's going to take place. God's righteousness is consistent. We see that in Genesis 18. Let's look there real fast. Genesis 18. Genesis 18, the depravity of Sodom. Start at verse 16. 18, 16. The scripture says, Then the men rose from there and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to send them on, on the way. And the Lord, said, the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall, shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. Remember what I said earlier? When you see righteousness, you usually see justice right along, like a hand in a glove, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against, against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. And Abraham went through this discourse with God. Look at verse 23. And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in the city? Far be it from you to do, a such, a, to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked, Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Abraham was confronting God about his own righteousness. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And God said, all right, Abraham, I'm listening. He said, so the Lord said, if I find Sodom, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare it. Then I will spare all the place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I am, I, I who am, but dust and ashes have taken up upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Would you destroy it all? Would you destroy all of the city for the lack of five? So you see Abraham go all the way down from 50 to 45, all the way down to 10, contending with God about sparing Lot, who was vexed who was stuck in Sodom and we know that Lot made it out now at the end of that discourse he said would you spare it if there were only 10 you know how many made it out right four made it out Lot his wife and his two daughters but we all know what happened to Lot's wife she made it out but she looked back and God made it clear and plain don't look back. Don't look back. When God gives a command, unless he has revised that command, like when Jon when he sent Jonah to Nineveh, it was to warn them of the impen of the impending destruction. God was about to destroy that city and he was offering his mercy through Jonah and Jonah being a rebel, you know, didn't want to go. He had to go to Whale University to learn his lesson. He had to go to Well University <laughs> to learn the lesson. And God had scheduled destruction for Nineveh. But he, he was able to re, he was able to revise the plan because they were receptive to the word of God. When you ignore God, you schedule a tragedy. When you ignore God, you schedule a tragedy. It's, it's, it's placed on a calendar. And it's, it's, it's going to happen. That's something that's really important to know about God. That he, he's not partial. If he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And that's how he's trying to make us where we're not partial. It's not because somebody told a sob story. I'm sticking with this is my standard. This is how I operate. And this is what I'm going with. I'm not going to vary. I'm not going to stray from this word. 
I'm going to stick exactly what the Bible says. What did, what did the devil tempt Eve with? Did God say? The voice, the third voice that comes in that tries to lure people away from the truth, it's always a third voice. When, when the devil wants to destroy you, he puts a person in your life. Some new minister, whatever you want to call him, will come around. That's how the devil gets in through that, earth, through that other voice. A lot of marriages have been destroyed. Third voice in the wife's ear, in the husband's ear. And all of a sudden, you see that wedge come into marriage, and now the marriage is divided. All because of the wrong voice being entertained. The voice of the Lord is the voice that we should be taking, taking heed to. We see in Exodus 32, God told the people, he gave them specific instructions. Moses is up on the mount with God getting the Ten Commandments. He comes down from the mount to see the people worshiping the golden calf. He says, whose side are you on? Stand on the Lord's side. And the only people that moved was the, the priesthood, the people that were priests. And, and, and Moses told them, slay these folks. 3,000 men were slain right as Moses was coming out of the presence of God. 3,000 people. So understanding God and knowing his righteousness is consistent, knowing that his righteousness is what governs his kingdom is critical because mercy won't always be given when people when people ask for it. You know why? Because most people have rejected. They've rejected, rejected, rejected and rebelled and rebelled and rebelled. And all of a sudden they cry out. Have you ever read what the Bible says in Proverbs 1? Look at Proverbs 1. <clears throat> Proverbs 1 verse 20. The Bible says, Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses at the opening of the gates in the city. She speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, would you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning scorning and fools hate knowledge turn at my rebuke surely i will pour out my spirit on you i will make my words known to you because i have called and you refused i have stretched out my hand and no one regarded because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke i also will laugh at your calamity i will mock when your terror comes when your terror comes like a storm storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. Why? I did all of that crying and shouting and praying and interceding. And you rejected it. You refused it. There's a point where people, this is why the fear of the Lord is so important. When you don't fear God, the Bible says you're a foolish man. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And fools despise knowledge. When somebody is talking to you about the gospel, when somebody is coming and trying to redirect you and point you in the right direction and you reject it, you refuse it. The Bible says, when they then when they call on me, I will not answer. Verse 28, they will seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel, and they despise my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way, and be filled to the full with their own fancies. In other words, you didn't want what you didn't want my wisdom, you didn't want my counsel. I hope your way works for you. Frank Sinatra said, I did it my way. Hey, I hope it works, man. I hope it works. You're going to eat the fruit of whatever your way is. Verse 32 says, For the turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me, it's about the voice that you're listening to. Whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. This is the word of God. This is the Holy Ghost saying, I'm calling to you. I'm stretching my hand to you. Why are you refusing me? 
And then there's a point that's invisible. It's a, it's a mark that you cross in the spirit where the Holy Ghost backs off and stops talking. The worst case scenario is when you have somebody in your life that's helping you and supporting you, they're praying for you, and all of a sudden, you don't hear from them anymore. They stop calling. That's a, that's a place where you want to take heed, man. When the mentor stops mentoring, when the teacher stops teaching, that's a dangerous place right there, man. And we just read in Proverbs 1, the outcome. Now they're, now they're diligent. Now they fast and pray and seek in the Lord. No answer. The heavens are as brass. So it's very important that we, we get this down in our souls now. We get it down in us now. Turn to Joshua 7 with me. Joshua chapter 7. God is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 7. And I'll read a couple verses here. Look at verse 1. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now God made it clear, don't touch the accursed things. What did they do? They touched it. God told Adam, he told Adam, you partake of this, this is what's going to happen. What did Adam do? He partook of the wrong fruit. Now here's where we see the consistency of God's righteousness, of God being right and standing on what he said. Look at verse 10. He's confronting Joshua because Joshua, his arm, he sent his army out and his army got beat. This was, un, this was uncommon. They weren't supposed to lose, but something went wrong. The army lost. So verse 10 picks up the story. It says, so the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they, they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed things from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from you. Now, God is telling Joshua this. This is why you lost the battle, man. Somebody has disobeyed me. That's in the camp. There's sin in the camp, Joshua. Get up off of your face. Stop talking to me. And I'm about to show you where the accursed thing is. Look down at verse 16. <clears throat> Look at verse 15. Verse 15. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant and the Lord and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So the, the penalty or the consequence was that this person was going to be burned because of what they did. Verse 16, so Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. He brought the clan of Judah and took the family of the Zerites, and he brought the family of the Zerites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. Now Joshua said to Achan, my son, Look at what, look at how he addressed him. My son, I beg you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Don't hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. Commandment number 10, thou shall not covet. We see a broken command, having taken the accursed thing, 
in the life of Achan. He confessed. He told the truth. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent, with silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took from they took them from the midst of the tent and brought them to Joshua. They, they brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zeri, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold. His look at this, man. This this is this is what's was so so critical. One person did this, and many people are suffering. His sons, his daughters, his oxen, his sheep, his his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? Why did you do this, Achan? Why? Why did you sin against the Lord, man? You hear the compassion. You hear the cry in his heart. Man, man, why'd you do this, man? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned him with fire after they had stones with after they had stoned him with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. If God says the fornicator will not enter the kingdom of God, the drunkard, the, the reviler, the thief, the liar, the adulterer will not inherit the kingdom of God. The homosexual, the sodomite, the pervert will not inherit the kingdom of God. Guess, guess what's going to happen? Guess who won't make it in? God is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. He's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, lying to the Holy Ghost, struck down. Peter said, man, it was y'all's money. The story is they had property and they were bringing, the, they sold the property and they kept part of the money. Peter said, man, it was your property. Well, I, I don't understand. That doesn't make sense. Why did you, it was your money, but you lied. We can't play with sin. We can't play with the things that the world is making a mockery of. We can't play with how God views marriage. We can't play with the righteousness of God. There's penalties and ramifications that come with these things. Is God love? Absolutely. Is God gracious? Absolutely. But God is righteous. He is righteous. And he's going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. Turn with me to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4. <clears throat> One Peter four. Verse 17. The scripture says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. What will be the end of, end of those that don't obey the gospel? If the righteous person, if the one that's pursuing the will of God is barely saved, scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Man, this thing is real. This thing is real. God's righteousness requires the right response. And I'll tell you that here in a second as we look at this next fact. Fact number five, God always makes the right decision. He killed 3,000 people with Moses coming down from the mount. Noah's flood taking out the whole human race. Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone raining down from heaven. You know what's amazing about all of those occurrences? God was absolutely right in what he did. 
God has never made a mistake. God has never done anything wrong. The Bible says that God is light and in him there is no darkness. God is not like human beings. See, we do things and we got to come before the Lord and ask for God is not like that. God is blameless. He's sinless. God is righteous. God is innocent. He has no he has the blood of no one on his hands. Everything that he did from the Old Testament to 2015 has been absolutely right. I heard a story about a lady who was struggling with someone that uh, had lost their baby. The baby had died. I believe it was a miscarriage. And she asked the minister, she said, what did God do with my baby? What, what happened to the baby? And the minister gave a perfect answer, man. He said, you know, the Bible doesn't say what happens to babies in that, in that instance. He says, but if you know God, he did what was right. Man, I take comfort in that. I don't know about you. I take heart in that. I can count on the fact that God does what's right all the time. And you know, when somebody falls into sin, God never gloats about it. He's never happy about it. He's never excited. God grieves when someone walks away from the truth. He grieves. He never gloats. And the perfect example of that is the father in the story of the prodigal son. We don't know how many conversations he had with his son, but his son wanted that inheritance and he took it away and spent it on righteous living. And that father probably was praying for that boy, interceding for that boy. And when he came home, the Bible says he was standing looking afar off for him. God never gloats on somebody that's fallen into sin. He, he grieves. He grieves. He's, he's, he's toiling with man. He's striving with man. To get us to come back home. To come back home. God has never made the wrong decision. Never. And that leads me to the last fact. The last fact is in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. This is the most hated fact of them all right here. This is the most despised and and thing that the the enemy hates right here this is what he's fighting jeremiah 23 verses 5 and 6 the scripture says behold the days are coming says the lord that i will raise to david a branch of righteousness a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth in his days judah will be saved and israel israel will dwell safely now this is his name by which he will be called Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. The Bible has given and God has delegated the judgment to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the judge. Jesus Christ is the Lord, our righteousness. It's not the fact that you and I can do anything to be righteous in the sight of God. It's his righteousness that we must receive. You notice it says our righteousness. Because the, the opposite of the righteousness of Christ in your life is your own righteousness. And a self-righteous person is a stench in the nostrils of God. People who are working, trying to work their way into the kingdom of God. No, man. There's only one that could have been a sacrifice. The Bible said his name is Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty. He stood in our place to pay the penalty to remove the wrath of God, the penalty off of you and, you and my life. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's his righteousness that we need. It's his righteousness that God wants us to receive. 
the Bible says in 2 Peter 3 that the earth is going to be burned with fire and God is preparing a place, a new heaven and a new earth where only righteousness dwells. There's a place that God is preparing where only white, where only righteousness dwells. And my question is, man, how do I get in that place? I want to be able to walk in that place and be accepted. And we see the, the answer to that. This is how we lay hold on the righteousness of Christ. Last two scriptures, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. This is how we lay hold on this truth. Because we clearly see that man in and of itself is not righteous. It's nothing you and I can do in our own efforts to be accepted by God. God has provided a remedy in his word. Isaiah 61. Look at verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Not just any robe, the robe of righteousness. That's what you need to put on. That's what you need to be prepared in a place where only righteousness dwells. You need a robe. You need the right garments. But before you can put on the garment, you must be washed. You must be clean. And the Bible says in Psalm 119, this is the last scripture that I'll quote here. You need a robe of righteousness. But just like you wouldn't put on some brand new clothes without having to take a shower, you go and buy some brand new clothes from the store. Man, you want to get fresh. You want to put that, you want, you want to be just as clean as the clothes are. And the Bible says in Psalm 119, how shall a young man cleanse his way? How shall I cleanse my way? How, how is that possible that I do it? The Bible says by taking heed according to your word. God is righteous. Take heed to the word of the Lord. And you can be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You don't have to bring forth your own righteousness. You take heed to this word and the word of God says, repent and believe the gospel. That's the message. That's the hope that God has provided for mankind. Repentance is the foundation for the new covenant. Repentance. What does that mean? A change of your thought, a change of mind, a change of how you view God. Most people view God as, man, if I were him, I could rule the universe better. Nah, man. What you're calling God is a liar. What you're calling God is evil. When you repent, your thoughts do a somersault. You realize God is much more good than you ever thought he was and that you were much worse off than you ever thought you were when you come into the light of God's truth. The Bible says repent. Turn around Turn around. If you're facing north, you turn around and face south. The Bible says, repent and believe. These are the facts. The word of God. Take heed to the word. And the Bible says, the robe of righteousness, the fact that Jesus Christ took the penalty for your sin, for my sin. He says, I'll, I'll cover you with my righteousness. So when the new heavens and the new earth come down, you don't have to try and get in with your own. You don't have to try to stand before God with all the things that you did. You can come in the, and stand in the place with Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. The Bible placed the, the burden, the, the penalty on Jesus Christ when we were in sin, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. That's the grace and truth of the God of the gospel. But it must be applied. Repentance is something that you do. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance tonight that you can allow God. You can put on this robe of righteousness and walk forward knowing that what God said he's going to do, the judgment that's coming on this world for 
for forsaking God, for not desiring God and not wanting God in their knowledge, the judgment is pending. And I don't want to be on that side. I don't want to be on the side of unrighteousness and evil. Man, I need a robe to cover me. And God is willing to apply that robe to you tonight if you'll repent and believe in the facts, believe in the truth. That's what it's all about. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. Standing on your word, your word is truth. Cleanse me by this truth and apply to me the robe of righteousness. Lord God, I repent and I pray in the name of Jesus that you show me the thing in my life that you don't like. Show me the relationships that need to be cut off. Show me the thing that separates me from you. Open my eyes, Father, that I can walk in the righteousness of Almighty God. Put the robe of righteousness on my back. Cover me in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You take that prayer and you ask, you. this is what you do. This is specific instructions. The endeavor becomes to remove the thing out of your life that separates you from God. When you repent, you're literally clearing out the debris for God to rest on your life. And you believe this word. You plug into the word of God. The word of God becomes your foundation for everything. It becomes your answer to life. It becomes what you seek and what you look at, what you research and what you look into. The word of God. That's what this is all about. Your meditation your meditation is in the word from this point forward. Reach out to the ministry because when the rubber meets the road, God is going to be right. No matter what the world says, no matter how many people fight and antagonize him, God will have the last say. God's righteous stand will remain. And I want to be standing in the righteousness of Christ. That's what it's all about. The prayer line is five minutes in, 805-399-1000, 409-367 is the access code. Get into prayer. This is where it all starts. This is what it's all about. Getting it, getting the prayer wheels going. Increasing that faith and confidence in the word of God. The number again is 805-399-1000. Don't forget, Dunamis Tabernacle. Check that out on the website, omegaministry.org. Don't forget the conference. Go on Facebook. Let us know if you're going. Hey, we want to see God raise up some folks that stand with him on the side of righteousness at all costs, at all costs. I stand with the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my righteousness and I'm going to grow in him. That's what it's all about, man. Be blessed. We'll see you back here on Sunday. Stay in prayer and stay in the righteousness of God.